free indeed. My story of true freedom. What I'm going to be sharing this morning is my personal testimony. But before I do, I wanted to give a little uh, intro. And my intro is, is this. Everybody has a testimony. And I, I'm not just saying that to be uh, nice. I'm saying everybody has a testimony. If you are a Christian, if you've ever given your life to Jesus Christ, you have a story to tell. Now, I have found there was basically two types of testimonies. You have the testimony of dramatic conversions, of, of somebody living for the world, but then turning and living for Jesus Christ. You have testimonies of, of just miracles and, and, and amazing things. And usually these are the testimonies that get highlighted. They get spotlighted. And people talk a lot about those kind of testimonies. High in demand, if you will. But there's another kind of testimony that is not as well promoted but I think is a more important testimony. What is that testimony you might think, you might ask? That testimony is the testimony of a consistent Christian life. It's a testimony of a person who was maybe raised in the church and never really strayed far. They listened to their parents' counsel. They loved the Lord from as early as they can remember, and today they're still in the church. You know why that story, why that testimony is powerful to me? Because even though I came out of the world into the church, listen, I, I, now that I'm in the church, I need the encouragement of how to stay in the church. And those that have stayed in the church, despite all of the, you know, the, the, the scandals and the, uh, the things in the media, uh, be, be, you know, all the, the cranky people in the church, you know, and yet they still stick through it. You know, the hypocrisy that they've seen. How many people have left the church because of that? Yet there's those that have says, you know, look, I don't care about the hypocrisy. I'm not looking at other people. I'm looking at Jesus. That's the kind of testimony that gives me hope and gives me encouragement now that I'm walking the Christian experience. So that testimony, I think, is more powerful. And so what you have is you have one, one testimony is the testimony of God's saving grace. The other testimony is the testimony of God's keeping grace. And listen, we all need both. And let's not be afraid to share our testimonies, friends. Now, today, mine is going to be a little bit more dramatic than others. But don't make that think for a moment, make you think for a moment that you do not have a testimony. If you're a believer in Jesus, you have one, and somebody needs to hear it. And with that said, I'm going to share with you again my story. My story goes back to whenever I was 15 years old. I was locked up in this uh, most... It was like a dungeon. In fact, it, this, the cell that I was incarcerated in was in like the basement part of a prison. It was loud all around me. I mean, there was the people rattling bars. There was inmates shouting. There was uh, the lights were out. And listen, I was a little bit scared. But as I'm sitting there in this prison cell, I begin to wonder at 15 years old, what would bring me to this point of being locked up. In fact, here's a picture of the cell uh, on the screen. And then also you have, these are the walls of the prison. This is Missouri State Penitentiary. This is the oldest prison west of the Mississippi. In fact, they used to call it the, the bloodiest 40 acres west of the Mississippi. I remember this is in Jefferson City, Missouri. When I was a little boy, I would actually take rocks and throw them over these walls, not knowing what was on the other side not realizing there was inmates walking around in a prison yard. Uh, this prison has been since shut down, but it was very operational when I was locked deep in that cell. Uh, this cell was actually the cell where they would house the uh, death row inmates before they would put them, put them to death in the gas chambers. Now, that was years back. They don't do that anymore. But that was a death row cell that I was locked in. What would bring me to this point? So I'm going to pause at this moment. We're going to take a little walk back to my early uh, youth and, and try to understand what would bring me to that point. I grew up in the typical American home. By that, I mean it was dysfunctional, and my parents were divorced. That's pretty much what you see around today. Now, I would, I, I, as I share my story, I don't want you to think that my parents didn't love me, but I will say it was a very difficult upbringing. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was about three or four years old. Um, it wasn't long before we began acting out as kids. My sister and I were both put on Ritalin to control our hyperactivity. Uh, in fact, diagnosed with ADHD as a young age. 
Um, but the reason my mom left my dad was because he was very abusive to her. He was an alcoholic, and he was just, it was, it was a really terrible time in his life. And he, he would beat her up. He would abuse us children. And my mom, she had to get us out of there. And so we escaped, and uh, we, we left my dad. There's a picture of my dad and my grandmother, my, mom, my dad's father. And uh, there's a picture of my mom with my brother and sister. Now, I had a brother that was two years older, and my sister was three years younger. And you can tell there by that picture, I'm pretty ornery, squeezing my sister's shoulder there. And, uh, you know, but growing up uh, with this divided home, eventually my dad sobered up and we was able to get back uh, partial custody. And so it was a back and forth ordeal uh, for a long time between my dad and my mother's house. And both of them remarried, so I inherited step-siblings, and so my family grew. But as my family grew, uh, so did my acting out. I began to just be... Uh, rebellious as a kid, very ornery, very uh, 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 mischievous. Um, and like my dad, uh, I became violent. I would begin, I, I watched a lot of TV and just learned pretty much everything I knew from television. I would watch television day and night. When I was staying with my dad, in fact, he had one of those big old satellites. Remember those, those big old ones that you, you know, you know, and just you'd be watching different. And we had all kinds of TV to watch. I mean, hours and hours, we just sit in front of the tube, staying up late into the night. We would be watching, uh, you know, we had like three HBOs, three Showtimes, three Cinemaxes. And listen, on Cinemax, they sin to the max. And I watched all of this without any parental guidance. And uh, I, now when I was with my mom, there was a little bit more control there. Uh, when she was home, she worked so much, we did pretty much what we wanted. But um, I remember one time we were watching The Simpsons and uh, the bab- we told the babysitter the mom allowed it. Well, she came home, and I guess in reviewing the day uh, what, about what we did, she mentioned the senses. My mother got us up in the middle of the night, my brother and I, and bent us over the bench by our table, our kitchen table, and we got a whooping. But, uh, but we, so we were, she, she had a little bit more uh, control on what we would watch, though we still tried to sneak as much as we could. But back and forth, back and forth, uh, like I said, very. I would try. I would start fights and, and get into fights in school. Get kicked out of school. Uh, I was a pretty socially awkward kid. I didn't have a whole lot of friends. I had this this the massive amount of curly hair as a kid. In fact, I remember in fifth grade, my very first fight I ever got into. Uh, a, a movie came out called Curly Sue about this little girl um, with curly hair. And when the, the kid in school called me Curly Sue, and so on at recess there in fifth grade, I got into a fight with him. Uh, I was very self-conscious about that, Uh, my hair. My dad wouldn't let me cut it. He made me have this um, mullet type thing, but with curly hair, it looks even worse. And so I was just, like I said, I didn't have a lot of friends. Uh, But but my brothers and uh, and a few other people I did know at school, we we played games. And some of those games we played was uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Have you ever heard of Dungeons and Dragons? or Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. What this is, AD&D, it's, it's a role-playing game in which you take on a character of, a, of, a, of an elf or a dwarf or a, a wizard, and you role-play, and, and you know, we considered it a lot of fun, uh, not realizing the danger of magic. In fact, that little symbol there above Dungeons and Dragons is the symbol of a, of a game we play called Magic the Gathering. And we would do this on a daily basis. It's like collecting cards, and it was very interesting uh, what we were doing is dabbling in witchcraft that we didn't even know about. We all we just considered it fun and games. But one day, I was about 13 years old, my brother read this book called Modern Magic. You can see it there on the screen. And that book is basically a how-to guide to do magic. Now, I wasn't really interested in magic per se, but you know, I, because I read tons of books, I read these books. Uh, 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 these Dragonlance series, that just these thick books of just these fantasy world. And because of that, I was kind of interested in this. So my brother read it. He said, I really didn't care for it. So he gave it to me. I read this book called Modern Magic. And listen, 
I was hooked. This, I said, this is so fascinating. This is amazing. I've got to check into this first. So I went to the school library. I'm checking out every book on witchcraft and the occult. I go to the public library. I'm doing the same thing. I'm trying to find out what is this witchcraft all about. And then I watched this movie called The Craft. And, and I, it, was, it was almost mesmerizing as I saw, even though I realized it was fiction, I said, but it's based on reality something that I could tap into. I want that kind of power. I want that kind of control. And even though at my young age, I really was, uh, felt that I, I wanted to manipulate things and people. I wanted my way. And so I, as I researched this, and I, I started to identify myself more with this, 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 this idea of, of being uh, um, part of witchcraft or, or uh, being part of a movement called uh, the being a Wiccan, uh, in fact, I tell you, there's a, there's a thing called the Wiccan Read that I really liked. It said, and harm ye none, do what ye will. The, the idea is that do whatever you want to do as long as you don't hurt anybody in the process. Now, people say, well, I don't really believe in magic. Now, I didn't really, I, I liked the culture. I like the philosophy. I like the fact that you could do whatever you wanted to do as long as you didn't hurt anybody. But I didn't want to call myself a witch. You know why? It sounded so girly. And I didn't want to be considered girly, so I didn't call myself a witch. But they had, they had masculine terms like warlock or sorcerer, you know, that, that we would like to identify ourselves as. But, but anyway, I started getting into a new group of friends, people who practiced uh, these type of things, or like me, was beginning to dabble into it. We kind of stuck together a little bit. I began to going to parties and raves, and uh, and guess about this time, I was I don't know putting clothes away in the closet or something. I, I noticed my dad's safe was open, and as I looked inside the safe, you know, any kid's curiosity is going to do that. I found a stash of marijuana, and I'm not talking about just a small stash. I'm talking about pounds of the stuff. And so I'd never, done, I'd never tried it before, and so I just began to experiment with it as I, as I stole some. And I tell you, I, it, it, people say marijuana isn't addictive. Let me tell you, I became addicted. I, I, I just, on a daily basis, I began to live for this. And then I found a whole new set of friends after that as we like to go party together. And, th I mean, my, these people really loved me, you know. Unless I didn't have marijuana, they didn't really love me so much then. You know, it was, it was kind of a love-hate thing. And... Uh, but when I had drugs, I was really liked, and so I was always intent on, on stealing more. I actually uh, reverse engineered the, uh, the lock mechanism there on the, 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 whenever the safe was open and was able to get the, act, get the code for that. Uh, I may have been a stupid kid, but I wasn't dumb. Does that make sense? Anyway, so I, I was able to get into there anytime I wanted and to steal as much drugs as I wanted. And so every day I lived for this party lifestyle, and I just thought I was just the coolest kid in the world. There's me and my sister. And I began, like I said, sneaking away and going to these parties. And when I was out at these, these parties, sometimes I didn't want to come home. And so I'd just run away from home and, and uh, just stay out for a few days. And my mom, one time when I did this, she became so scared for me. She actually started putting up these missing posters uh, all over town and trying to, to find her boy. She didn't know if I was uh, hurt or okay. She just had, didn't have an idea. But the reality was... I didn't care. You know, I had this philosophy, do what you will, harm you none, right? So I just didn't care. But the reality is, is that I was hurting people. See, sometimes in our life we think that, that you know, when we just do things our way, that we're really not hurting anybody but ourselves. You ever heard this before? But the reality is, friends, we, no, somebody once said, nobody is an island. And in fact, Romans 14, 7 says, for none of us lives to himself. And so we have to realize that, that what I do affects other people. And so I was hurting people. Can you imagine the heartbreak and the pain I was putting my mother through as I was beginning to get in trouble and acting out more and more and, and just, just traumatizing her and her life? I was selfish. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I didn't care how it affected you. Well, one night I was out at this... Uh, uh, we were actually getting ready to go to this, this little club for teenagers. There was no alcohol, so they let teenagers in. And was, we were out, we were pulling into the parking garage 
when the lights turned on behind us, we knew the cops were there. And, and so we all jumped out of the vehicle and we began running. We're you know, digging our pockets to pull out all of our stash and, and to get rid of the drugs we had and the paraphernalia. And what we did is we all went separate ways. I said, I'm going into the club. So I ran right into the club. There's a short line. I finally got in the club, got my hand stamped. I ran down to the, to the basement where the bathrooms were and I went inside the bathroom to wash my face. And I say I washed my face because I had... You ever heard of the gothic movement? Yeah, I got into that. I had this black face paint on and lipstick and fingernail. Anyway, uh, I had all this on, and so I'm trying to wash up and clean up because I knew if this officer had seen me, then he would be able to recognize me. So I wanted to get cleaned up. And, and uh, so after that was over, I kind of went uh, back out into the party. And, and over on the corner, there was a little table. It was pretty much the only chair that was available, but there was another guy sitting at the table. Uh, he was just sitting there reading. I don't know how you could read with all that noise going on. I mean, this is like heavy metal music. I, was, this is, I loved my heavy metal music. I was just, I was a headbanger, I considered myself. And uh, again, I thought I was so cool. Not a lot of people did, but I did. And Anyway, so as I sat down with this guy, I am still as high as a kite. I'm scared, I'm rattled, I'm shaking. And when I sit down, the guy next to me can obviously sense it. Now, this guy, he's actually dressed in a long black trench coat. And he just, he looks, has a very somber look on his face. He's got a goatee on. And, and, um, and, he, and as I sit there for a while, he eventually asked me, he says, uh, I can tell you're troubled. Is, are you Okay. Now, I, didn't, you know, I, I mean, I was high for once. So I wasn't thinking clearly, but I, I guess I, I started to, to open up a little bit to him and share with him what was going on. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't think it would be a confidential informant or something stuck there. But anyway, so I told him my story, what was going on, and, and he said, well, have you ever heard of Satanism? Now, up to this point, I had only heard of Satanism in passing. I never really studied into it, never really researched it. But I was even told, in, as I was involved in witchcraft, to stay away from Satanism. You know, you got white magic, you got black magic. He says, white magic's good, black magic's bad. And so I stayed, I tried to stay away from it. But as I said, well, tell me more. He began to kind of explain the philosophy behind Satanism, a lot of the ideas behind it. And you know what? Sounded pretty normal to me. Well, normal for how I was thinking. Again, I was still high. And as I'm listening to him sharing, he says, you know, look, he says, I want to demonstrate for you the power of Satanism. He said, what I want you to do, if, you, if you're willing to do this, go through this ritual with me, and, and, I, and I, I think we can take away your nervousness. And, and I'm, again, I'm still rattled. I'm still look, kind of looking around for the cops to come in and try to find me. And as I know the car was there, and we had a lot of drugs in the car, so I know that there's, you know, there's probably more officers now. And so I'm... Uh, I'm like, okay, okay. So as we're sitting there, all this noise, the, 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 the party going on around us, loud music, he pulls out of his, out of his trench coat, and these guys got like tons of pockets, he pulls out a dagger, it's about this big, and he pulls out a noose, like, it's not like a big noose, but it's like a little bitty noose, and he pulls it out and he says, we need symbols of death for this to work. And so he, he, he slides one over to me, and he has one himself. We do this, he says, repeat after me, we do this, this hand symbol, uh, over the, which was the same symbol we used in witchcraft anyway. But the point is, uh, I began to recite after him. And he told, and, and, like, and I would be, and listen, at this point I'm realizing I'm praying to Satan. I'm calling out to Lucifer. And we called him by like, like 10 different names. Lucifer, Beelzebub, Azazel, all these different names. Calling out to, uh, 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 Mistopheles was another name. And, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, we're praying to Satan. And, when, and, and I'm, he's got some Latin words and English words. And after we're done with this prayer, he, you know, he called it a spell. You know what happened? All of a sudden, not only was I not nervous anymore, I wasn't even high anymore. My mind was thinking as clear as day. My buzz was completely gone. And I just sat there in amazement. And I said, there is power in this. He told me about this book called The Satanic Bible uh, by Anton LaVey, and he told me, you should get a copy. And so I went out to the bookstore, and I got me a copy of this uh, Satanic Bible. And, and I, you know, I had, just understand, from this point, I had listened to a lot of heavy metal music, and most of the heavy, music, heavy metal music bands are Satanist 
bands. I mean, they, 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 they praise Satan, they worship Satan, but I thought it was all fun and games. But now as I'm, you know, when you listen to heavy metal music, you know how they're, they're, they're head banging and, and they, you know, rah, 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 you just can't understand what they're saying. That means you have to go open the lyrics up and actually read what they're saying because you can't follow them unless you do that. And so you go read the lyrics of these songs and you're, I mean, these songs, I mean, I was listening to bands like Cannibal Corpse, Deicide, which means God Killers, uh, you know, bands that really, you know, uh, Slayer and Pantera that actually were worshiping Satan. And I found myself really understanding more about this as I began to read the Satanic Bible. And, and, and you know how in witchcraft, do what you will, harm you none? Satanism had a principle as well. It actually isn't written in the Satanic Bible, but this is, this is Crowleyan Satanism. And it says this. This is called, uh, it's actually Thelema is what it's called. But it's, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. You've probably heard this before. In fact, it's repeated in many Hollywood films. But the idea of whatever you want to do, follow your own heart. You've heard this? Is Is it safe to follow your own heart? Look what the Bible says in Proverbs 28, verse 26. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. And so, you know, I I was trusting in my own heart. I was wanting to do what I want to do. But in this, when I I got involved in Satanism, it was do whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter who you hurt. And so if there's ever a sense of me that I'm not hurting anybody but myself. You ever ever heard somebody say that? "It's It's my body. I can do with it what I want. But you realize now, I don't care who I'm hurting. I want to get my way. I want this power. I want this control. And Satanism is the means to do that. Now, I wanted to join the Church of Satan, but the problem is it cost 200 bucks and you had to be 18. I wasn't either. I, I, I didn't have 200 bucks and I wasn't 18. But I did profess it. I became a dabbler in this religion. Now, there's controllers. There's people way up that, that they, they do a lot more than I ever got involved in. But I believe in the philosophy of Satanism that you are your own God. And I loved that idea. Of course, I was living for myself. And so I continued in my rebellion. Uh, there, there I am with my curly hair. And I began to, again, <clears throat> every night I would sneak out, go to parties. Well, one night I came back from a party. My light was on. I was busted. Mom caught me. You know what? Forget about it. I'm going back to the party. So I go back to the party, and I just stay at the party. And the party goes on. And I stay at my, this house and this other friend's house, and I just don't even go home uh, for like a week. Well, eventually the cops catch up with me. They lock me up. And I've, at this point, I've been arrested so many times for burglaries and assaults and, and possessions and all these different things that whenever they lock me up this time and they find me positive for marijuana on the drug test, they said, we're not letting you back out. And so I was, I was crediting Satan for all the times I got out, but now they're not letting me out this time. They said, you're going to have to go through some drug treatment. you got a drug problem. I said, my only problem is you took away my drugs. I wanted, you know, I just wanted more. But here's what happened. The reason I wasn't learning is because of this scripture right here, Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Nobody was really taking my, 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 my rebellion seriously. And with just a slap on the wrist, I wasn't learning any lessons. And so, but now they finally told me not to go through this drug treatment program. And when I went through this drug treatment program, they ended up sending me to this prison. Remember I started out the story talking about this prison? I was locked deep in the belly of this old prison. They wanted to scare me straight. And so they took us, a group of kids, and they would take and we shoved us all in there. They shut the doors. They locked the doors. They turn off the lights. And there I am in darkness, screaming and hollering all around me. And again, I was thinking about what brought me to that point. But instead of my heart softening and saying, you know what, this is not the life for me, my heart got harder. And I said, forget it. I said, if they they want to play this game, I'll play it. I'm going to get through this drug treatment program. I'm going to graduate. I'm going to go go back to my parties, and, and I'll show them. But friends, that's not how it worked out. After that, scared straight. By the way, let me just say, you cannot scare people straight. It just doesn't work. You know, scaring somebody, you know, might have a temporary effect. But fear does not work as a long-term solution. There is one long-term solution. You know what that is? Love. You can love somebody straight, but you can't scare them straight. 
love is the only thing that will keep him. And, I, and, I, I, and I'm afraid I never really experienced that unconditional love. If I only knew about it. I would find out about it later, but I didn't know about it then. So anyway, going back to the drug, pre, drug rehab program, uh, I'm trying to play the game, but you know what? I'm still smoking cigarettes. I began when I was seven. Now I'm, I'm, I'm now 15 years old, and I snuck some cigarettes. Well, one day, I get caught. And the facilitator of the program who caught me, he says, I got to report it, so he calls it in, and, and, and he makes me do these reports. And listen, I have never been so angry as I have in my whole life. I begged him not to tell. I knew if I got kicked out of this program, I'm going to go back to uh, my hometown. They're going to they're going to they're, they're going to they're going to nail me to the wall. I'm going to they're going to all the burglaries and the assaults and all this stuff. They're going to they're going to make me do a lot of time somewhere. They they threaten me with that. I did not want to fail this program, but yet now I'm busted smoking. I know they're going to kick me out of the program, and uh, and so right then and there I began to strategize. I said, forget it. If, if I'm going to go out, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to kill this man, and I'm going to kill myself. I'm not going to go back. And do you know what happened? I called out on Satan. I performed a spell of destruction, saying a specific prayer. By the way, they took my satanic Bible from me. That's another thing that made me really, really mad. But I still knew some stuff. And Satan... I'm not giving him, you know, I, I take full responsibility for my decisions. But strengthened through the satanic forces, I took a knife and I attacked this man. And I hurt him really bad. They took him away to the hospital. Uh, he was, I mean, I didn't know if he was going to live or die. I mean, he was cut so bad. They took and they locked me up and they sent me to the juvenile hall. They locked me in the, in the, in the, the most secure cell in there. You know, I had a camera on me 24-7. Couldn't leave the cell. I got food through the door. And this was my existence. I, you know, I was real, I mean, I was suicidal. I wanted to kill myself. I wanted to die. I, I didn't, I didn't want to live. But the reality was there was no way to do it. I just had a bunk and a sink, and that was it. So as I'm sitting there, I become, I'm not just suicidal, I'm now hating God, I'm hating the world, I'm hating my parents, I'm hating everybody. I'm lonely, I'm scared, and because of what I did, I'm, I don't know if I'm ever going to get out of this place, but I did have one thing to look forward to. Once a week, and I was in there for a long time, once a week I would get a phone call, about a 10 or 15 minute phone call from my mom or my dad. And so my mom was going to call this Friday. And so finally, the time came. I went to go get the phone. And as I'm listening, uh, or as I'm, as I'm talking to my mom, you know, she's asking me how I'm doing. I'm denying what I did. You know, I'm saying somebody else did it. You know, I mean, all the evidence showed I was guilty. But anyway, I was foolish. Uh, but my mom asked me, she, she said, son, do they have Bibles in there? Hmm. <laughs> She's always pushing me on this religion thing. And, you know, it's frankly got me a lot of pretty, pretty upset at many times. But here I was. I wasn't in a position. I mean, I, I need my mom. I mean, these short 10-minute conversations, I didn't want to argue with her. So I said, yeah, mom, they got Bibles in here. I could actually look across. This is an actual picture of the detention center I was stuck in. Uh, I eventually got some privileges, and I got the phone calls as, you know, I was in there long enough. And, uh, and there it was. I could see a whole shelf full of Bibles across the room. I said, yeah, Mom, we got Bibles in there. She said, well, why don't you read one? Why don't you just you know, take it back to your cell and read? Now, we're allowed two books in our cell, and I've been picking books off the shelf, more fantasy books and story books and living in this fantasy world. And, uh, you know, when I, when I was reading the Satanic Bible, the, the Satanic Bible says the Christian Bible is riddled full of contradictions and errors. And so, you know, I really didn't have any interest. But as my mom told me this, I began to walk past this bookshelf Day after day after day, as we went to our showers, we went to the chow hall, you know, day after day. And finally, I said, you know what? Because, I mean, every time I walk past it, I mean, I can see that Bible right there on the shelf, and it's just, like, speaking to me. And I'm like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take that Bible, I'm going to take it back to my cell, and I'm going to read it. But instead of reading it to learn, I'm going to read it to prove it wrong. I'm going to find those contradictions. I'm going to find those errors. I'm going to put them Christians in their place. And, and so I started beginning to strategize how to do this. So when nobody was really watching, you know, I, didn't want, I had a reputation for being a Satanist. I didn't want to lose that. So I, I grabbed the, the Bible off the shelf, this little teen study Bible, and I took this back to my cell when nobody was looking. 
And as, I, as, I, as I'm now in my cell, I'm locked down about 22 to 23 hours a day. And I began to read. Now, this is a cell block that I was locked in. And my cell was number 17 there. You can see they would cover the windows so the, uh, all of us wouldn't communicate with each other. You were not allowed to talk. You were locked in a cell by yourself. Uh, here's a picture of the cell that I was in. And uh, it was just a bunk and a, and a metal commode. And, uh, and as, I, as I began to read, I began to read it the story of Genesis. Because it's a book, right? You start beginning and read to the end. So I began in Genesis, and I began reading just the most fantastic stories in the world. I mean, I, I, mean, I thought my fantasy books were, out, were far out there. I mean, now I'm reading this Bible I've never read before in my life. And, and, and I'm reading through here, and it's, and it's telling me that God creates the world in six days. This global flood destroys everything. Uh, you know, I, I read about, you know, these dreams that, that Joseph has and Abraham and, some, and, you know, sacrificing his son. Well, it never happened, but, you know, it's like these were some very strange things to me. But it's an interesting story. I mean, it's, it's out there, but it's very interesting. You know, then you have Exodus and, the, and this, 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 you know, the, the Red Sea that just splits and they walk over on dry land. I mean, this is incredible. And I keep reading through. I read, you know, the story of, uh, of Joshua and the sun standing still. I said, come on, I thought my fantasy books were far out there. And I'm, I'm having a hard time believing this. And why? Because I didn't believe in a God of miracles. Uh, and so, anyway, I keep reading through the Bible, and it's just, but, you know, as, as far out as it seemed, I was riveted. And I would read day in and day out. In fact, I read the whole Bible through in a month. So, I mean, I just, I just, I had a, a just, I mean, at, at nighttime, they would shut off the lights at like 9 o'clock. And I'd be up there in the, in the light that, that was shining through the outside window. I'd be up there and I'd be reading like this. Because I was really into the story. And I finally got into the story of uh, Samuel. Are you familiar with the story of Samuel and, 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 and David and Saul? And uh, as I'm reading through this story, you know, it's, it, again, I, I'm not believing this. I, I, you know, it's, it's a collection of stories to me, but I'm not believing it. But I come to the story of Saul, the king. You know, Saul, uh, he ended up taking on a young man named David, and, and, and they worked out good at first, but then David got, Saul got jealous of David, and uh, he says, you know, you know, Saul has killed his thousands, but David is tens of thousands. So Saul now wants to kill David, and David is running from Saul and with, his, with his men. Well, of course, you know, if you go back in the Bible, this is 1 Samuel chapter 24, you have David fleeing, and he runs to this place, I think it's called En Gedi, and as he's there, he finds a, a, a cave, because Saul is right on his tail. King Saul is, he's, he's you know, tra tracking him down, trying to kill David. And David and his men run into the cave. And as Saul comes by there, uh, you know, he, he, he's, he's, he comes by the cave, and he goes in to use the bathroom. That's what the Bible says. And as he's in there using the bathroom, David and his men, you can imagine how quiet they were. You know, they, didn't, they, they wouldn't be caught by King Saul. And, of course, King Saul's men are all out there. And I'm sure it's pretty loud with all the, the armory and such. And so uh, he didn't hear David in there. But David was able to sneak up behind King Saul. And David cut off a part of Saul's garment. You remember the story? And as he cuts off part of this garment, you know, his, his men are like, kill him, kill him, take him. You know, now's your time. Saul leaves the cave. David follows him out. I'm sure it was at a distance. And as he's out there... He says, Saul. And he says, look. And I'm giving you the short version. He says, I had an opportunity to kill you. But I didn't. He shows him that cloth that he cut off. And Saul, I mean, you can just imagine the wonder and amazement. This man I'm trying to kill, my enemy, has the option, the opportunity rather, to kill me and he doesn't do it. Can you imagine Saul standing there? I mean, just dumbstruck. And he said, David, my son, is that you? He said, you have repaid me good, whereas I've repaid you evil. David had mercy on Saul. Now, did Saul deserve to die? Even David says that. He says, God avenge you, but I'm not going to do it. You're the Lord's anointed. He deserved to die for his evil crimes. But David did what? He had mercy. Now, this, is, this is incredible for me. It was just, I, it, for the first time in my entire life, even though I had a hard time believing this story, or all the stories, 
my heart was moved, you know? I'm kind of rooting for God a little bit in the, throughout this story. And, and, I, and, I, and I felt, for the first time in my life, guilt. I, I did not feel bad for what I did. I mean, I felt bad that I got caught, and I felt bad that I may end up being in trouble for a long time for it. But I didn't feel bad for what I did. But now, for the first time, I'm standing in this, right where Saul was. I deserve to die. But David, though he had opportunity and even the right to kill him, chose not to. Instead, he had mercy. And I, and at that moment, I mean, I just, you just imagine the turmoil in my heart. And I'm just, it's all that, that stoniness is breaking up. And I'm like, have mercy on me. I want that mercy. I kept reading and I come across the story of David as he's standing there on his balcony. This is 2 Samuel chapter 11. He's standing there on his balcony. He's looking out. What's he see? He sees a beautiful woman bathing while all his men are off to war. Her husband's off to war. He takes her. They make a baby together. He tries to cover it up by killing her husband. Now here David is guilty of not just adultery, but he's now guilty of murder. Here the same David that I was rooting for earlier is now guilty himself. I just shake my head. and I say, it's just like them Christians. You know, they say one thing and they do another. And so I was a little disappointed in David. In fact, I was a lot disappointed in David. But I kept reading through the story, and I come to the place where Nathan the prophet comes to him and rebukes David. Remember that story? Tells him the story of that little sheep, that little lamb. You know, I felt rebuked too. Because just like David, I didn't know, again, I don't know if my, this guy I attacked lived or died. But I, was, I felt guilty. I felt wrong. And I wanted the same mercy that David wanted because David, notice he prayed and he searched God and he, he just begged God for mercy because God says your firstborn son through this, this adulterous relationship is going to die. And he begged God on his face seven days fasting saying, God, please let my child live. And the child didn't live. And I realized at that moment that even if I was to have that mercy from God and forgiveness, there's still going to be consequences. I kept reading through the Bible, and I was just amazed. I mean, I got, I got, I got through the story of, uh, you know, Israel going into captivity and through the kings and all that, and then how the story of Job. I finally came to the book of Psalms. And when I came to the book of Psalms, I came across this specific psalm, Psalm 51. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there. Psalm 51. I came into this psalm, and I read the little preface at the top of the page. It says... To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. This is the psalm of repentance that David wrote after he was convicted of sin. After Nathan came to him and told him that story and said, you are the man. I'm going to read some passages from this psalm. And I want you to imagine the effect that it had on me. Verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. He cries out, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. And it was, friends, I, every day I just saw it. I, I, I'm starting, you know, remember I told you I begin to feel bad and guilty for what I had done. And I'm just I'm reliving this experience and, and just feeling so terrible about it. Look at verse 7. David prays, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. I said, God, can you make me that white? Create in me, verse 10, a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. God, can you take this heart and make it clean? Verse 14. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. <laughs> the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. Oh, I was, I wanted deliverance so much. God, forgive me. I knelt there at my bunk, and I began to pray. And I began to seek God like I had never done in my entire life. And I said, God, I don't know why you want me, but here I am. If you can forgive me like you can forgive David, Lord, I'll be yours. I'll renounce my Satanism. I'll, I'll serve you forever, Lord. Forgive me. And there that day, I cried out and I received 
a cleansing that I never knew possible. I received such a, 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 an uplifting, a, a rejoicing in my heart. I didn't know a whole lot about the gospel, but I knew that what David did is something that I could do and that God, if he would receive David, he would receive me. And so I became a Christian. Now this is where my journey begins. I mean, this is where the fun begins. I continue reading through the Bible, and now all these stories that I thought for fantasy before, I'm realizing these are true stories. And it's all making sense now. The whole picture, I'm seeing the big picture, and it's just amazing as I see the love of God. I finished reading the Old Testament. I finally come to the New Testament, and I begin reading the book of Matthew. Now, Matthew is just incredible because I read the story of Jesus Christ, and I am... You can't help but fall in love with Jesus when you read that story. And I learn about who, I mean, I've heard Jesus' name. I mean, you know, I've said it many times in cursing, but now I'm learning who this was. The Messiah, the Son of God, the soon coming Savior. Though, you know, I saw when he went out, he, all the miracles that he would do, miracles, and he would have compassion on people. He would heal the sick. He would cleanse lepers. Oh, he loved people. He did things unselfishly. I wanted that. And not just did I see miracles in Jesus' life. Listen, miracles were happening now in my life. I was locked up long enough. I began to earn some privileges. I stayed out of trouble there in the juvenile detention center. And and my my dad was able to send me a Walkman radio. They let me have it. And so now I can listen to local radio. And listen, we have five Christian channels. And so I listened to all kinds of preachers all day. Every time when I was locked in my cell, I had my headphones on. And I'd be listening to, to, to all of these preachers. I'm listening to late night AM radio, listening to um, uh, all of the uh, just like preachers from all around, uh, even some pretty wild stuff. As I'm reading through it, I'm getting a little bit confused, but there's another miracle that came through. My mom was able to bring me a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. Listen, this tool in my hands, I was able to study out all these things that confused me on the radio. These preachers, they were always, uh, at first, it was wonderful. They were all agreeing with each other, but the more closely I listened, I realized they're all disagreeing with each other. This one says this. This one says this. And as I'm reading through it, uh, I'm like, you know, the, uh, the concordance just gives me an answer. I go look up the word angels. I read everything the Bible says about angels. I read everything the Bible says about worship. I read everything, and I'm just I'm able to understand these subjects in full. But I was still confused about one thing. Um, I watched a lot of TV growing up, and, 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 you know, the only way the Bible or the TV d- demonstrates baptism is by pouring or sprinkling. And so that's, but I, I'm reading the New Testament. You know, Jesus, John the Baptist preached uh, baptism. Uh, Jesus preached baptism. The apostle Peter preached baptism. Repent and be baptized. He said, I want to be baptized. Mark 16, 16 says that, you know, he that believes that is baptized should be saved. I said, Lord, I want to be baptized. But I'm locked in the cell all the time. and I can't get baptized. And so what do I do? I look over my metal commode there. And I say, you know what? That, there's water. What's stopping me from getting baptized? And so I go over there, I, 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 I stop up the sink, and I begin to fill it with water. And as that tank gets a little higher and higher, I'm praying to the Lord, Lord, you know, I want to surrender my entire life to you. And what I do? As that water gets full enough, I lean my head over very reverently, and I grab some, and I say, now I baptize myself in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I humbly go over to my bunk and I kneel there and pray. And, and I, you know, I look back and I just think, the, the, you know, the angels must have been just belly laughter, you know, just watching me do this. You know, but, but God, isn't he amazing? He just, you know, I, I'm, I'm, God, I'm sure, has mercy uh, on stuff like that. But I didn't know any better. That's what I thought baptism was. I mean, every time, you know, I've watched like America's Funniest Home videos, there's always that, that baby getting baptized, is peeing in the water or something. And, 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 I'm, and I'm like, okay, that's how baptism happens. And so I needed to... Now, praise God, I was able to get baptized later God's, uh, God's way, God's method. But um, I began to learn... As I'm studying through here, I'm listening to these preachers on the radio, and, and, and just every time they bring up a new subject, I'm like, whoa, what is he talking about? I would go study the subject out, whether it was about the second coming, or about what happens to people when they die, or understanding the sanctuary, or prophecy, all these different things. I wanted to know, and I just studied day in and day out. In fact, some of you coming here may have heard much about the Sabbath. You have grew up maybe with the Sabbath. I had never heard of the Sabbath before in my life. I mean, I'd heard the word before, but I had no idea what it is. 
And, you know, reading through the book, of the New Testament and the book of Acts, I mean, the Sabbath was a very important thing. I mean, they just wouldn't stop talking about the Sabbath, 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 Sabbath. And I'm like, what's the big deal about this? And I hear one radio preacher say that Sabbath is Saturday. I say, say what? And so I, you know, I never heard this. Before. I mean, the word Sabbath is synonymous to Sunday with me. It's all I knew, you know, except Black Sabbath, you know, the band I would listen to. Uh, but I didn't know any better. And so I finally opened up my Strong's Concordance and read every time the word, the Bible used the word Sabbath. And, uh, and it was just clear as day. You read through it and, it just, and you can see that the, 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 the seventh day of the week was the Sabbath. And the first day of the week had no significance whatsoever in the, in the Bible. And I said, well, this is weird. Because all these churches keep Sunday, and yet the Bible teaches Saturday. I said, well, I guess I'm going to be weird too. And I'm going I'm to do what God says and keep the Sabbath on the correct day of the week, even if I'm the only one in the world that does this. I had no clue anybody else. But I mean, there was a preacher on radio. I mean, who knows where these guys are at? They could be in another country for all I know. I was spend 383 days in that, in that cell as I waited for them to certify me as an adult. They, you see, basically I committed my crime at 15 years old, and so uh, for a 15-year-old to stand trial as an adult, you have to go through a hearing where they determine you competent as an adult. And so they said, you did an adult crime, you're going to do adult time. And so they sent me off to the jail. And so they, as they sent me off to jail, they took a booking photo, and this is the book, I was 16 now. And uh, you can see I let my hair grow out a little bit. I, you, know, you know, I read in the Bible about the Nazarites. They let their hair grow. They didn't cut it. I said, well, why not, right? So I just I decided not to cut my hair and let it grow. But instead of my, my hair doesn't grow down like most folks. It grows out. And, um, and so just it grew out. And uh, they called me Big Perm. That's what they, that was my nickname in county jail. And uh, I did my best to shake that name. And thankfully, it hasn't stuck with me. I keep my hair shorter for that. But... Uh, but big, big perm is still better than uh, uh, Curly Sue, so I was okay with that. Uh, but now here I am in county jail, 16 years old. They lock me up. I'm in a cell with this, with this meth dealer. Um, and, and, you know, in juvenile, I wasn't allowed to really talk to anybody, and we were in our own cells. Now, jail is like, you know, you can talk to whoever you want in your cell pod. And, and uh, so I'm locked up in this jailhouse. I'm talking to... Uh, all these people. I mean, we have people in there that are in there for, for bank robberies, child molesters. Uh, one guy was in there. In fact, they, were, they moved him into my cell. He was in there. He had killed a mom, her three kids, and she was not, almost nine months pregnant. It was him and another person. Actually, two other people. The, the, the woman that was involved in it, uh, they ended up, they strangled. It was all over meth. It was, it was ridiculous. And he's now in my cell, and he look, he's looking around, he's like, he sees little green guys running around the cell. I mean, he's not even all there. Listen, I prayed extra hard when he was in my cell. And I'm just, Lord, get him out of here. But, uh, but I, you know, there's something I held on to, a promise of God's word. Acts chapter 16, I believe it's verse, or not Acts, it's uh, Proverbs 16, uh, verse 7. It says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And so I'm saying, Lord, if there's something in me that's not pleasing to you, I want it out. Root it out of me. And as I, I began to, you know, so I'm just saying, Lord, I, I claim your promise. My enemies are going to be at peace with me. I don't want to get in a fight. I pray, Lord, protect me. I'm, again, I'm 16 years old. I couldn't grow a whisker on my face if I wanted to. Clean, I mean, as clean as could be. And, uh, and that, you know, and people noticed. They talked about the baby face. But I said, Lord, protect me. And you know what? God did. I spent 264 days in that jail. And you know what happened? I, it was cool because I got to study with other inmates and bounce ideas off. I learned a whole lot. I was able to share what I've been learning. I learned how to sing hymns. We started going to chapel services. And uh, now my, my music before, I mean, listen, I used to be a headbanger, uh, a rock and roll. And now... That stuff is not even, I don't even like the taste of that music anymore. And, and crazy as it is, I began to love the hymns, the beautiful hymns. And even this contemporary music of just, you know, where it sounds like rock music, but it's, they call it Christian. Like, that doesn't even sound good to me. I just, I want what, what, what sounds Christian. And so I just, I fell in love with that. And it's really weird that here's this 16-year-old that loves the old hymns. And, uh, but anyway, I ended up turning 17 when I was in county jail. I, I was in there for about nine months or so, and uh, I pled guilty. I went to the judge. I said, Judge, I'm guilty. I did what they accused me of. 
I'm sorry. Now my, my attorney's trying to get me off. And they're like, well, you know, you, you were under all kinds of psych, psychotropic medications whenever you committed your crime. You were in drug rehab for drug addiction. You were, and they're trying to say all these excuses to get me off, or at least to, 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 to mitigate it and to make me have a less, lesser sentence. But you know, I said, Judge, have mercy on me. I wouldn't take the plea bargains that the, that the prosecution was offering. I just said, Judge, have mercy on me. And so he went, and he began to deliberate. And I said, Lord, you know I'm in your service for the rest of my life. If you want me to serve in prison or in a, they have long-term juvenile detention centers where you could like be until you're 21 and then they'll release you. I said, but whatever you want, Lord, I am at your service. And so as I'm sitting there, that we have a sentencing hearing. My victim now, he had passed away uh, at this time. He, you know, I, the, the, there was complications. I don't know if it was from what I did. They didn't accuse me of murder. They accused me of assault. Uh, so they didn't attribute it to me. But his mom came in, and she looked at me when she was giving her testimony. And she, he said, if he did not do what he did, my son would still be alive. And I believed her. And I felt, you know, Lord... If I deserve to be locked up for the rest of my life, I was facing two lives in prison. That, that's, like, that's like 30 years without the possibility of parole. Two, 60 years, really. Two 30-year sentences. Assault with a deadly weapon. But Lord, here I am. The judge, he goes and he deliberates on all the things he had heard. And he came back. And he did sentence me. 20 years in prison. He said... We want to make sure that nobody learns from your example that they can do whatever they want and get off. There is consequences. And so he used me as an example. He said, I'm going to send you away for 20 years to prison. For those who don't know, that's 7,303 days that I was to be locked away. And I remember that very first day as they shackled me up and bound me and sent me off. I was now 17 years old because I was, if you were 16, they would have locked you up in protective custody. But 17, they put you out in general population. So I'm in general population. Because of my long sentence, they put me into the house with everybody else with long sentences. And so I was bunked right below a guy that had seven life sentences. He was never getting out of prison. And many of these people were never getting out of prison. So they had nothing to fear. And, and, I, and, I, and it's, I remember that how they, when you came in, they, 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 they strip you completely naked. They spray you down with bug spray. You're standing in a room with a bunch of other naked people. And, you know, here you are. I mean, and you're just praying, Lord, protect me. But finally, I get settled in, and, I'm, and God is protecting me. I get in conversations. I begin sharing and witnessing. Uh, I, I study with Muslims and, and share with them and, and help them to know more about Jesus. While I'm locked up, you know, they, they ship me to several different prisons. I finally settle in one, and, and I, I get my GED. I go to the chapel, and I get a job there. And now I have a whole library at my disposal. I can study anytime I want. And I, I, I just, I, I work as hard as I can. I'm, I'm, I make about, uh, depends on, usually eight fifty a month, but sometimes a little bit more than that. And I'm saving up my money. I'm, I'm paying tithe on my eight fifty. Can you imagine sending 85 cents tithe? But I, I paid faithfully my tithe because I believe that's what the Bible taught. And, 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 and as I, as I you know, went through this whole experience, I'm still learning, I'm growing, I'm witnessing, I'm sharing. And, 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 I, and I just, I, what I do is I turn my penitentiary into my seminary. I want to work for Jesus. So I start getting visits. This is my stepsister, Amy. And uh, she comes in and visits me and my mom and, and, and my dad came in until he, he passed away in 2005. But he came in and would visit me faithfully about every month. And, uh, but, you know, the hardest thing about prison wasn't the violence. And I saw some violence, by the way. I saw people getting stabbed to death with, with wire, a piece of wire right in front of me. I've seen people get, just get beat up so bad, cut. I mean, it's just terrible. And on a daily basis, almost the fight's taking place. Only by God's grace, I never got into one fight through my entire prison experience. Not one. There was an incident where a Muslim tested me. He, he, he whacked me across my cheek one time. We were working in the kitchen together, and he said, um, you say you're a Christian, now prove it. And he wanted me to turn my other cheek. So you know what I did? I turned my other cheek. By God's grace. Because, and, and you know, listen, he, this guy came up to me a few weeks later, and he apologized for what he did. And, uh, and it's just, it's amazing what the miracles of, of my life. But anyway, that, that, that happened twice. The other story's in my book. You have to get it. But anyway, um, 
But I never got into a fight, though, never an altercation in which I, I, was, I was compelled to hurt somebody because I had vowed to the Lord that I would never use my fists to hurt somebody, that I, that I would be a, a, a person that would renounce all kinds of violence for the rest of my life, that I'm going to be like Jesus, not coming to destroy people, to, but to save people. I want to win people. And so violence would never be an answer for me. Uh, it doesn't matter if I get beat up or killed. I'm not going to use my hands to hurt somebody. Now, I told you there was something worse than all that in prison, and it was the loneliness. I was lonely. When you're away from your family, I didn't have a whole lot of friends that really cared to call me friends, but just, just not having people in my life that, 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 that could come visit me on a regular basis. I mean, well, I, let me say that. My parents would come visit me, but I mean, not having that daily interaction is hard. That's the worst thing about prison is that, that isolation. There's my little sister, Nicole. She was, she's my half-sister, my dad, and my stepmom's baby. And, and uh, she was four years old when I got locked up. And uh, she's, when I, when I was, well, I'll tell you later how old she was when I got out. But, uh, but listen, remember that promise? When a man's way is peace of the Lord, he makes even his enemies do you at peace? I claim that every single day. God protected me. So that 20-year sentence that I received... Can you imagine, I, was now, I, I, I turned 16 when I was locked up, 17, 18, 19. I turned 20 years old when I was incarcerated. I turned 21, celebrating my 21st birthday when I was locked up. My 22nd, my 23rd, my 24th birthday, serving the Lord inside, studying God's word. 25, 26, 27. Finally, I was 28 years old, and I go see the parole board. And you know what they said? They said, you've been good. They said, you, you haven't been getting in trouble. I said, what do we say we let you out next year? Next year, that would be six years early. Can you imagine? Listen, that year was the most exciting year of my life. <laughs> I'm getting out in a year. I was finally released after 14 years incarcerated. And listen, friends, that day of freedom, I'll never forget. I walked out those prison doors, I was free. I am so thankful that God had mercy on me that, that I didn't have to serve all those 20 years. But listen, the miracle, I mean, just if the miracles happened to me when I was locked up, the miracles inside or when I got out was just as amazing. I, I, I was looking for a job. I mean, who would, who would hire a guy? I'm now 29 years old. I never had a job in my life. I never had a driver's license in my life. Who would hire me? <laughs> you know, I put in 40 job applications and nobody wanted to hire me. I had job interviews. And as soon as they came up to my felony, boom. You know, you're, you're, nobody's going to hire a felon, especially a dangerous felon at that with no job experience. But because I didn't have a job, I can go out and volunteer helping the church out. And so the church I was working with, we'd go knock on doors and we'd meet people, do surveys. And, um, but the pastor who I was knocking on doors with, one day he calls me up and he says, you know why? We're looking for a Bible worker. Are you interested? I said, yes, very much so. What's that? And so he explained to me that, you know, you would be coming and you would, te you, you would be teaching the Bible door to door. You'd be going and finding people in your community that have interest in studying the Bible. You'd study with them. I said, well, that sounds amazing. I love studying the Bible, much, even more with other people. And so I was hired as a Bible worker. Now, I didn't pay really anything. They put me up in the church basement uh, because, you know, I didn't have anywhere else to go. And, um, and I was, somebody gave me a car, a godly man, very, uh, very much gifted me. And, um, and so I, was, I had a job and a car and a place to stay. I, I was able to do that Bible work for about two years. During that time, I ended up meeting uh, this beautiful lady. And uh, she was just, uh, not, not only was she beautiful, she had a beautiful character. And she loved Jesus. She loved working for Jesus. And as we began to get to know each other and, and we began to uh, date or court or whatever you call it, we began to know each other. And, you know, it was as clear as day. God had intended us for each other. Now, now, there is a love story there that ends in marriage. Well, no, I should say begins in marriage. The love story hasn't ended. But you have to read the whole book, read the book to get the, the whole story there, okay? It's just it's a tremendous love story of what God has done for us and uh, brought us together. We ended up going to Costa Rica, which was another miracle, for our honeymoon. And, uh, and of course, uh, typically after marriage, you have babies, and so that's what we did. Uh, my wife there with my baby purity, and uh, and so many miracles since then. We went um, 
to where I'm at today. Listen, I don't have time to get into the whole story, but I want to, I want to bring it around. I want, to, I want to share with you some lessons that God has done in my life, taught me. Remember when I was involved in witchcraft? And harm ye none, do what you will. You know, you basically do whatever you want, just have a little bit of consideration for other people. And then I got involved in Satanism. Do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law, which is do whatever you want, period. But listen, when I became a Christian, my whole paradigm changed. Jesus says in Luke twenty two forty two, he says, Not my will, but thine be done. I mean, this is revolutionary. This is, this is something that is supernatural, friends. This is, you cannot have this. Just in, you can't, you're, nobody's born with this desire to be selfless. It has to be a supernatural miracle. You've got to be born from, a go, from above. You know, it was my will that got me locked up. It was my will that, that, that hurt people. It's my will that got me in so much trouble. Friends, when your will is in control, you're dangerous. It doesn't matter who you are. We must always surrender our wills. And it's only as we do that that we're going to be happy when we have a complete willingness to surrender to God and say, God, whatever you want for me is what I want for me. Proverbs 14, verse 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I did what I thought I wanted to do. But the reality is this, and I want this to soak in. I wasn't the only Satanist. Do you realize Satanism just simply says it's okay if you're in control, if you're in charge? That's the, that's the philosophy behind Satanism. You're your own God. Do what you want to do. There are so many people in this world who have that attitude that are just as much Satanists as I was. And if we have that, that, the attitude that our will is in control, you know what? You're a Satanist. I'm a Satanist. We must have the attitude of Christ to put our wills to the side and say, not my will, but thine be done. Now, I was in physical bondage. I was incarcerated, locked up. But I was spiritually free, amen? As free as anybody in this world. Now, I'm going to ask you, what has God been speaking to your heart as I've shared with you my story? Maybe you feel like you've been in bondage, even though you wasn't in a physical prison. You were locked up in your heart. Maybe you're locked up to some kind of addiction, some kind of sin in your life. Maybe it's depression or... or, or, or I, but whatever it is, you feel like you're not in control. Or maybe you think you are in control, but you're in bondage. You're locked up, and you want to be free do you want to be made free? You want to, you, maybe, you're in that, maybe you're that person who wants to quit playing the religious game. And you want to get serious with God, maybe for the first time in your life. I got good news. God has the power, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, to break those, that bondage. He can give you true freedom, true liberty. Jesus put it like this in John chapter 8. He says, it's John 8, 36. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You know, it doesn't matter what you know, it matters who you know. The Bible says Jesus is the truth. It doesn't matter what kind of bondage you're in. Whether it's, a, whether it's a bondage to anger or a bondage to pornography or a bondage to, 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 to whatever kind of sin in your life. Whether it's tobacco or alcohol or gambling. God can set you free. It goes on to say in verse 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. This is the kind of freedom that Jesus offers. Free indeed. True freedom. You know what this means? This means when somebody is a murderer, which I would consider myself to be in the past, he can make a murderer into a gentle saint. He can take a thief and a liar and make him honest. Jesus has the power to set us free. He can take a rapist and make him pure. He can make proud people humble. He can make grumpy people happy. <laughs> That's the power of God. He will make you free. Now, some of you look at your life. You say, well, I've been in a prison. And maybe you think it hasn't been that bad. But you know that you still have things you're holding on to that God is saying it's time to surrender. The world is telling you, don't worry about it. Not that big a deal. But God is convicting your heart and saying to give it up. 
There's a worse prison than I experienced. It's the prison of guilt. If you've done things that you want freedom from, you want cleansing from, you feel trapped and hopeless, there is hope in Christ. God can make you free, and you can be free indeed. So no matter what your sins are, no matter how far you've gotten, no matter how, how, how deep you've gone, God, God can reach down and pick you up and carry you out. That's the power of God. So would you say amen to God's love and forgiveness? Amen. Would you say amen to, to surrendering all to him? Amen. You can be free. Let us bow our heads as we pray. Oh my God in heaven, you are of God of gods and a king of kings. And you call us to come up higher. Thank you for that mercy and that forgiveness, that love that you give to us. Lord, we don't deserve it, but you give it to us anyway. You gave your son Jesus. Praise you for Jesus. Now, Lord, these dear souls that came forward, they said, Lord, they've been shackled, but they want to be made free. And by the virtue of them coming up here, Lord, they have by their faith said, yes, Lord, they accept that, free, that freedom. They accept that forgiveness. They accept the cleansing, Lord. And now, as they walk out of the sanctuary, Lord, they are free indeed. They are free because you've made them free, Lord. And may we walk in that freedom each and every day. Now, these precious souls that came forward, Lord, to say they are ready to surrender all, to go down to those watery, that watery grave, that old man dying, coming back up, a new person in Christ, Lord. Bless them in that decision, Lord. Help them prepare for that day when they will make that entire full commitment to you publicly before your people. Bless them, Father, and bless you our God of the universe. We love you, and we thank you so much that you never give up on us. Lord, we commit to never giving up on you. May that be true through Jesus' power, for it's in his name we pray. Amen.